peace, peace, a lack of peace. Peace, uh, people experience a lack of peace in so many ways, don't they? From construction work taking place next door, mowers and leaf blowers that break the silence when you're nursing a headache. There is a lack of peace when you walk on eggshells behind closed doors where family violence takes place. Peace and quiet are broken by a screaming child when you're trying to get some sleep, an adolescent or a teenager. A neighbour's party goes on into the early morning hours. Perhaps like others, you reach the point of longing to pull on the noise-cancelling headphones over your ears or to cry, stop the world, I want to get off. We long for a change, we long for the noise to stop, for peace to come, when the inner turmoil ends and peace. We long for peace, for a change. Where do you go for peace? How do you find peace in a world for a change? Let me pray. Jesus, as we take some time to explore your word, as we take some time to better understand what it means to experience your peace in our lives, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, that you would move amongst us as we gather together around your word, that you would shape us, that you would mould us, that you would create us again and continue the work of your creation and help us to know afresh your peace. Amen. Well, we see it all around us in the world, don't we? Conflict and absence of of peace. Conflict in the world where in Michigan a teenager takes a gun to school, to Afghanistan, to the Middle East and Eastern Europe where tensions rage and also in Asia. Conflict in our world with people being abused or bashed for doing what they are asked where nurses get spat on. Bullying and abusive behaviour in workplaces Family breakdown because of tensions and fights. Conflict in ourselves, expectations we place on ourselves, which struggle to be realised. Bad habits that eat away at our confidence and hopes for a better future. To resolve conflict, opposing parties will sometimes come together to try and work through their differences. Representatives from opposing sides will will spend some time to meet. They'll announce a precarious, temporary ceasefire. And bystanders or the powerless hold their breath and wonder if this ceasefire will hold and the peace agreement will last this time. At other times, groups of peacekeepers are sent to broker terms of peace and then work with the opposing sides to maintain peace between those previously conflicted. When an Israelite king would send in representatives to those in opposition to announce an end to the conflict and the terms of peace, it was Basir in Hebrew or euangelion in Greek. The gospel message. It's not surprising that the Bible picks up this concept of the terms of peace or an end to conflict and the word gospel is used again and again. After all, consider the context of Romans chapter 5. Writing to a group of people in the first century, Paul seeks to compare and contrast the first Adam with the second Adam the the Adam figure, Jesus. While Paul's writing style is best understood as you read it over several times, the comparisons are still there. To pull in the concepts to to a a more accessible prose, Peterson's The Message um, paraphrase puts it like this. 
You know the story of how Adam landed us all in the dilemma we're in. First sin, then death. And no one's exempt from either sin or death. That sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at a dead-end abyss of separation from God, just think of what God's gift poured out through one man Jesus Christ will do. There is no comparison between that death-dealing sin and this generous life-giving gift. The verdict on the one sin was uh, the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes, sovereign life, in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life-giving, life-gift, this grand setting everything right that the one man Jesus Christ provides? Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us, all, uh, got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death and that's the end of it. Grace because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. Life that goes on and on and on, world without end. The account of Adam and Eve speaks of peace with God being broken by Adam and Eve's desire to rebel against God and to be like God. They thought they knew better than God who created them in the image of God. Ever since then, all of humanity has lived conflicted with God. But not only does our rebellious nature have us in conflict with God, but it also results with us being in conflict with others around us and also in conflict with God's creation. Rather than stewarding God's creation, we try to bend it to our will so that we can take from it what we want. And when others do something that we don't like, we try to bend others to our will so that we can get what we want. From giving people the cold shoulder to open conflict and the cold war. Like an insidious weed, we can try and chop it off at the surface, the stuff that we can see. But in reality, you need to go deeper. You need to find the roots of this conflict. You need to dig deep through time and find where it all began. Because of sin at the very start, we live in a conflicted world today. And that's where the first Christmas comes in. For generations, God sent prophets to speak of a promise, a promise of a peacemaker. 
where we were at war with God, in conflict with God, the Son of God came in that first Christmas. Isaiah spoke of this reality, as Aletheia reminded us in our kids' spot earlier today. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Into a world filled with conflict at all levels, the peacemaker comes. The peacemaker comes to offer the gospel, the terms of peace from Creator God. That our warring with God can end. That forgiveness from God is possible. That those, that those things that were once broken can begin the process of restoration. God, not us. God initiates the peace agreement. God becomes vulnerable, comes into our world as a baby, born to a teenage girl and a working class chippy as his stepdad. And in vulnerability and dependency, the seeds of peace are sown. Then throughout Jesus' life, the realities of the Prince of Peace are lived out, are taught, are walked. And rather than protecting and cherishing vulnerability, we took advantage of it. We overpowered it and we nailed it to a cross. But God's plan for peace was not over yet. God's plan for peace means taking on the consequences of conflict. You see, injustice perpetrated against each other needs correction and consequences must be paid. Our raging rebellion against our Creator needs to be dealt with and the wages of sin paid. Peace cannot be achieved where justice is absent. Peace cannot be achieved when wrongs are not righted. Without debts paid and justice served, peace is flimsy and paper thin. A story is told of a woman who stood before her father, a courtroom judge. She'd broken the law and the law demanded a fine be issued. But the woman could not pay the fine. So there was conflict between the woman and the law, just as Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 5. Nevertheless, justice needs to be served. So the judge orders the fine to be paid, knowing that, the, that she has no means by which to pay it. But then after making his ruling, the judge moves from his seat of authority and takes off his judicial robes and comes to the place with the guilty and goes into his own savings and pays her debt. As limited as it is, it gives us a glimpse of God. God the Son, knowing that we were in conflict with Creator God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. God the Son comes as wonderful Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. While we sought to repeat history by getting God out of the picture by nailing Jesus to the cross, God instead made history by ushering in the fullness of peace that would ripple through space and time, taking on our sin in the conf conflict and paying our debts for the conflict. Jesus the peacemaker came that very first Christmas to repair history, to provide the means in which you can change the course of your life, 
your history. Peace with God achieved through Jesus. That was the promise wrapped up in the strips of cloth and resting in a feeding trough. But what of our reality now? The thing is that we would rather live, rather than living true to this outworking in our life, we can easily find ourselves stripping back and going back to old habits, old conflicts, old desires that rear their head and push and shove to get their way. When conflict emerges, we snap at others when we're having a bad day. But there, even in those moments, the Prince of Peace calls. He calls the future reality to be lived out in our lives today, to make peace, to live at peace. It's why Paul starts all but one of his letters with, those, with words along the lines of, May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus' birth is the gift that keeps on giving. We can keep believing in this gospel message that we can choose to live it out in the way we make our decisions today. To be people of grace. To be people of peace. To extend grace and peace to others, especially when they tick you off. Paul writes in Romans 12, 17 to 21, Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honourable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your, enemy, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good, by living with peace. As we grow in our understanding of what it means to live with God, we should grow in our efforts to live at peace with others. As we grow in our understanding of what it means to experience forgiveness from God, we should grow in our efforts to forgive others. But not only that, we know that there will be times where peace may be absent from us, from around us and even within us. That's where we need to press in to Jesus, to find confidence and clarity in our relationship with Jesus. When we lack peace or lose sight of this relationship where, that we have with the Prince of Peace, who guards our heart, we seek to try and control, to take back our situations and those things that are around us as we, that are outside of our control. Satan wants nothing more than to have us take our eyes off God, to have us focus on the issues and other people's behaviours and how wrong they are and how we deserve to be vindicated. Satan loves to steal peace, to kill our peace and to destroy our peace in Jesus he tried it 2,000 years ago and the evil one still wants to try it again and again around you. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, paid the price for conflict. And as a result, forgiveness and peace are gifts that Jesus still offers to us today. And as we experience true peace, and as we continue to circle back to peace with God, we can be better centred in a world where there can be such an absence of peace. We can also work for peace in situations and circumstances around us as much as it depends on you. 
look for opportunities to bring peace, to build peace, to protect peace. It reminds me of a prayer by John O'Donoghue that rests well at the end of a day. As the fever of day calms towards twilight, may all that is strained in us come to ease. We pray for all who suffered violence today. May an unexpected serenity surprise them. For those who risk their lives each day for peace, may their hearts glimpse glimpse providence at the heart of history. That those who make riches from violence and war, that they might hear in their dreams the cries of the lost. That we might see through our fear of each other, a new vision to heal our fatal attraction to aggression. That those who enjoy the privilege of peace may not forget their tormented brothers and sisters. That the wolf might lie down with the lamb, that our swords be beaten into plowshares and no hurt or harm be done anywhere along the holy mountain. For some, they think Christmas is a a meaningless tradition, but they could not be more wrong. In a world that is frequently drawn to conflict, the gospel message of Christmas is that in Jesus we can find and we can live with peace for a change. Let me pray. Jesus, Prince of Peace, in a world around us where we see conflict, where we see selfish behaviour, where we see a me-first generation and self-indulgent behaviour. Lord, we ask that you would instil in us afresh an awareness of your peace that passes all understanding, that defies the realities of the moment. And in so doing, May we be conduits of peace to the world in which you have placed us, to those you have called us to serve, to those that you have called us to speak words of peace, of healing, of forgiveness, of calm, of centeredness in you. Lord, when we internally find ourselves in conflict, May we look beyond the issues and to see the opportunities for you to be at work. May we pause for peace, for peace in us and for peace through us. For a child in a manger wrapped in cloth, in all its vulnerabilities and all the opportunities. Lord, may you, the Prince of Peace, reign supreme in our lives and in your church. Amen. So how might we respond today? Well, I encourage you to take some time to be still in your body. It may not be now, it may be later, but to take some time to be still in your body and to listen to the rhythms of your life and where there is a lack of peace. Invite the Holy Spirit to peel back those layers and to reveal what's behind this lack of peace, this disquiet in your soul. Invite Jesus into that space to be your Prince of Peace. Consider how you can centre yourself in times of conflict around you and represent Jesus' peace to others. Commit to moving from being a peacekeeper to following Jesus to be a peacemaker as much as it depends on you.
There's going to be some music played, and as that music's played, I invite you to prayerfully respond to the things that God is saying to you today. God bless you.